My name is Chris, and when I was six years old, I was diagnosed with a rare and life-threatening disorder called Hunters, or MPS2. Now, Hunters didn't actually run in my family, and no one ever even heard of it. But once they figured out that I had it, they wanted to test my entire family to see if anyone else was a carrier or had it themselves. And it was determined that my younger brother, who was actually only a few months old, he also had it. But no one else in my family had it. So it turned out that my mother was the carrier. And Hunter's is a sex-linked disorder, meaning that females can carry it, but don't exactly have it. So she never knew she had it. Now, as far back as I could remember, I always knew I had Hunter's. So growing up with it really wasn't that different to me. I had a lot of friends. I even played baseball for a little bit. And then I was actually able to play hockey with the Anaheim Mighty Ducks when I was in fifth grade, which was probably one of the coolest things I've ever done. Growing up with Hunters always seemed pretty normal to me. I mean, as far back as I could remember, I always knew I had it, so I didn't really have a life before it. But there was one question that always lingered in my mind. I always wanted to know how other people dealt with it. How did people affected with the disorder deal with it? How did their family deal with it? How did their siblings deal with it? So to answer this question, this past summer, I spent 90 days on the road, drove approximately 15,000 miles, and stayed with about 40 different families. Now each of these families had one person, or at least one person in that family that had an MPS disorder. A mucopolysaccharidosis, and we kind of said, what? You know, what? What is that? You know, both of us had medical training, but we had no idea what that meant. I think meant they or... spent maybe two minutes on it in medical school, so. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it was mentioned somewhere in our medical school training, but, you know. I had to look it up. And, and then, all the parents I speak to, they're always like, the doctors never even heard of it. Right, yeah. right. And now we have proof from doctors, yeah, yeah. like, yeah. unless you're a geneticist, never heard of it. Yeah, exactly. Never heard of it. Never seen a, a patient with it in any of my medical training. And then when they uh, gave us the name you know, Hunter Syndrome and Mucopolysaccharidosis, we started doing all the Googling online and we saw all these photos of boys that, you know, sort of look similar to Aiden. Yep. He was diagnosed in July 2010. So about two years ago? Mm hmm about two years ago. Okay, um, what were the signs that made you figure that there was something up? Well, for at least six months uh, prior to that, he had very severe sleep apnea. Um, but the real uh, testing began about a year or so before. And it, the, the signs that he was displaying were um, extreme delays, delays in everything, delays in um, uh, crawling and delays in walking, um, didn't talk until he was about two. Um, at a certain point in his um, infancy, I, I started realizing he was looking different, started getting a larger belly, um, started snoring. Um, so th in the beginning, I just thought he was snoring and he was getting a big belly and, you know, he was just delayed and, and everything like that. And um, each time he would have a checkup, an 18-month checkup and a 24-month checkup, the doctor said the same thing. Um, at that time, we had finally um, been assigned to a pediatrician. So um, each time he would have his um, developmental screening, he, he, he never passed. You know, he wasn't doing any of the things that were appropriate for his age, to which the doctor referred us to Children's Hospital in L.A. for hearing and speech and genetic counseling to be done, genetic testing to be done, because she was convinced that he had something called coarse facial features. To, and, and I had no idea what she was talking about. 
Um, neither did she. She she just said, I, I have no idea what, and I believed her. I honestly believed her. She said, um, I know that there has to be something going on here. Um, he's just, he's sick all the time. He's, he, he can't breathe, it appears. Um, you know, he has a very enlarged um, abdomen. You know, those, those are the type of things that she herself um, was was concerned about and then of course I was concerned about the fact that he just just didn't seem to be progressing How old were they when they were diagnosed? Wendy was she had just had her second birthday she was two and Kaylee was six or seven months Okay. Um, were there any signs that Wendy had some type of disorder? She always had things wrong with her. She had sinus infections, but there towards the time that she was diagnosed, her skull had fused closed. She no longer had the fontanelles, and I thought that was odd. And she had like a, a raised area on the back of her neck where the th skin was very thick, and her eyes were getting cloudy, and her hands were really tight, and no one could tell me why. We went to, I think, four different doctors. And you finally went to a geneticist, or? We got a new pediatrician, and we walked into his office because Wendy was so sick. And we had just given up on our pediatrician. And he goes, I think you have bigger things to worry about than the cold. I think she has a storage disorder, and I think it's Hurler syndrome. He actually nailed it without, and he sent us to a geneticist. <laughs> We found out about Jaden in October of 2009, and right after we got his results, Brooklyn was about three months, and so they tested her right away, and so we got both of their results kind of end of October. Now, um, were there any signs that triggered in your head, like there's something going on with your children? Yeah, uh, Jaden, his speech wasn't coming along um, like a lot of his, the kids his age were and uh, so we were a little concerned and we got his hearing checked and um, I, think, I think that's about it and then our pediatrician saw some things that could possibly all be kind of related together um, enlarged liver um, a little bit of a larger head uh, the speech delay so he recommended for us to go see a geneticist so we went down to Children's Memorial in Chicago and as soon as the geneticist saw him, he knew that he had NPS. We just didn't know what kind. <clears throat> we didn't know what type yet, so that's where we waited for three weeks to find out what it was. So, and then obviously Brooklyn. Kissing me to you, won't you say you love me too. Go Biba! 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 With a great big hug and a kiss from me to you, won't you say you love me too? Oh, thank you, Biba! Thank you! Oh. Mommy and Ange now?
Oh yeah, she gets a hug. Angie, Angie, Mama, and baby. Does Ellie get a hug? Give Ellie a hug. She's spitting up. Oh, nice, big sister. You want to give her another kiss? But then the, the information I was given by that geneticist when he was two and she walked in and said, oh, yes, San Filippo, we need to test him. She handed me this pamphlet and it was a terrible pamphlet. Yes, the it was horrible. It was frightening. It was disturbing. It was something she should have never, nobody should, that was the wrong information. Let's just put it that way. It's not like that at all, but it was very scary. So you don't think it's as bad as they say, or it has its moments? It has its moments, but I've, John's fought, like I said, for his life forever, so it's nothing new. I know he's a fighter. I know he's going to be, it's going to be what it is. He's going to do the best he can, and I'm certainly him too. When did you first start to realize that there was something a little off about him? When he was a baby, he was sick all the time until he was two years old. And the doctors kept telling us they didn't know what was wrong and calling us in new antibiotics by phone. And then I started looking into my asking family about what was in our family. Because you actually have hunters in your family, correct? Yes. Do you want to elaborate? <laughs> Okay. Um, my mom had two brothers with Hunter syndrome 60-something years ago. And she doesn't really remember because she was three. She has she had 12 siblings, or 11 siblings, and um, they were seven and eight when they passed away. What age was Matthew when he was diagnosed? He was age eight. Okay, and what were the signs? Well, at age two, he uh, was speaking. So um, we started to take him to do different doctors to see, you know, if there was anything wrong with him or anything, if he had any um, learning disabilities or something. He wasn't progressing like the other kids. So we started at the age of two, um, pediatrician, then we went to a um, developmental pediatrician from age two to age five, they saw him every six months, never diagnosed him with anything other than maybe a speech and language disorder they told us he had. Um, then from there we went to the Kennedy Krieger Center, we went down to New Jersey to see a specialist there. No one diagnosed anything other than um, he's got, um, he was mildly mentally retarded. Uh, and then uh, at the age of eight, we, uh, at the suggestion of my mother, decided that we should go see a geneticist because to rule out something like Fragile X or something like that. And we didn't even consider a uh, recessive genetic disorder because nothing ran in the family or any other side. So we thought, oh, all right, we'll just go to rule that out. And that's when they picked up a urine test was slightly high for um, sugar and and then they took the blood and they found the diagnosis. When did you guys start to realize that they had some kind of disorder, something medically wrong with them? Jared would probably be, he was five? Four or five, maybe? Not so much the medical part, but... Something different. Yeah. We knew something cognitively was going on. So the that first... Was, that's, that's the 11-year-old. So uh, probably, mm -hmm. yeah, six years ago? Preschool to kindergarten age. Mm -hmm. So the first sign with mental, not physical? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how long did it take to get him diagnosed? Five, five years. years. <laughs> Four or five years, yeah to get him diagnosed, so mm -hmm. he was undiagnosed until last year. Yep. First thing they thought in uh, kindergarten was autism. 
they checked, they, we, you know, did some autism uh, rating scales and stuff, some testing. He was observed by an autism specialist and she She said ruled that, that out right away. Yeah, she said that he had some characteristics that were similar, but that he didn't fall on the scale. And they went from that to ADD, to anxiety, to a number of different things before they eventually landed on this because of his enlarged liver. Mm -hmm. Just at a random yearly checkup with a doctor she felt in the large liver. So went to a specialist in Grand Rapids and that's how they found out. Did a liver biopsy and then went from there. Okay, and from that, how did you figure out your other son also had it? Uh, other son had his kindergarten hearing screen. Mm -hmm. Well, pre kindergarten. His his screening to get into kindergarten, his hearing test. And he failed that. So we took him in to get tested just to rule him out because he doesn't really show a whole lot of the signs. And so he got that. Sign backwards, Caleb. Backwards, Caleb. Caleb backwards, Caleb. Caleb backwards. Brother. Backwards. <laughs> Are you going to be the catcher? Huh? Okay, be catcher? better, better. Oh, I'll, I'll we'll play. Close. What's your name? Come on, What's better, 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 better. Here we go, better, better, better. Chris? <laughs> Grandpa? <laughs> Miss Tim. Um, come on, Taylor. Come on, Taylor. It's a fake out. Yeah. Check it out. Yeah. Watch out. Jared, back up, buddy. Back up. Jared. Hey, you're okay. Here goes. All right, here you go. Oh, oh, nice hit, buddy! Here you go. Whoa! This young lady is 19 years old, and she shows none of the physical signs of anyone else I've met with an MPS disorder. That just shows you that although these disorders are all related, your body can react completely differently to them. I'm Ted McCannon. I'm Susan McCannon. We're Casey McCannon's grandparents and guardian. Okay, and Casey is how old? Casey is 19 and she has MPS 3A. How long ago did you guys find out about? She was 15 before she was diagnosed correctly. What did they think it was? Uh, they thought, well, the first diagnosis, of course, was ADHD before preschool, or during preschool. And then um, we knew she was uh, somewhat mentally challenged, somewhat a little bit slow. But then you guys started to notice a regression. Yeah, she got a little progressed along in school and stuff and we noticed regression which wasn't typical of what they were trying to tell us was wrong with her Why then we realized um, that uh, the diagnosis was wrong and it took us many doctors in a period of 15 years to really come up with an answer. Okay, um, I've noticed by interacting with her that she has absolutely none of the physical features that are common with any MTS. Yeah, after she was diagnosed, we come to find out later through testing that the uh, gene mutations that she carries are a mild form of gene mutations. Oh, you missed it. see when you guys started to realize there's something different? Uh, 
two and a half? No, no? even before, one and a half. Yeah, because he was not talking at all. Oh, he wasn't talking? No, not at all. And um, what doctors did you take him to? We took, uh, first uh, uh, his pediatrician noted something wrong with him. And we are advised to take him to neurologist in yeah. this town. Took to him to a pediatric yeah. neurologist. Yeah, first. Yeah. And he. He's the first yeah. one who guessed. Yeah. He said hurlers or hunters. Yeah. Uh, so he actually thought that was one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, how long after that did the testing? God, it was almost. Really quick. No, I thought it was at least five or six months before the real diagnose. Yeah. They said they, because of all the yeah the ear symptoms right. and the hernia, they were pretty sure. And then that they took his blood and sent it away. Yeah. But that took a while. No, no, it, it's only a month. Really? The end of end of December, uh, we took him to that pediatric neurologist. Then he. Took a urine test through his regular pediatrician, and we got result back really quickly. And 2000, I think 2009, February, he was diagnosed. Uh, like, uh, uh, you know, one of the MPS, but we didn't know the type. And in May, uh, no March, a month after that, we found out he got MPS two. When you guys figure it out, was there some kind of trigger or did just random? No, she was a year old and her older brother was holding her and carrying her outside and accidentally tripped with her and gave her a slight concussion. Because of the concussion, we had to go in and do CAT scan and that's how they noticed something was wrong. So she was diagnosed within a year. Um, seeing how you had two older boys, that maybe there was something quite off about Cooper? You know, when the doctor said, maybe, you know, we want to get some tests done, I thought he was crazy because Cooper walked when he was one year old. He said enough words to get by. Um, he was the baby of three kids that talked, you know, they talked for him. He never... He communicated his wants and needs to us. So I didn't think, no, I didn't think anyone was wrong. They, the, the doctor talked about maybe a possible loss of hearing, which then translates to many St. Filippo children. But he never had an earache. He never had, he was never at the doctor's. So no, I, I thought my doctor was crazy. What was it about him that triggered something in the, the doctor's mind. The three things that he mentioned were hearing loss, um, the traditional flat um, 
bridge of the nose, okay. the broad, broad, I guess the broad features, and that he wasn't, I guess since he wasn't talking yet. So yeah, it was, uh, yeah. And he had never, our, our pediatrician had never ever seen an MPS child in person ever. Yeah, he was diagnosed around nine months and we traveled to Minnesota, uh, met with some doctors there that were doing bone marrow transplants and ended up actually going out there for about three months to have the uh, transplant done. We were lucky because back then the children weren't getting diagnosed that quickly. Um, even right now they don't get diagnosed. We, we met a lot of families that had gone from doctor to doctor and it took over two years for their kids to get diagnosed and some of them didn't end up having transplants because other things had progressed like maybe heart problems and that kind of thing but um, it was a fight with the pediatrician but finally at the six month checkup got us to the right doctor who happened to know the look and knew immediately what test to do so we were very fortunate. Okay. Thank you Dr. Doc Feingold. Dr. Murray Feingold <laughs> from the uh, Waltham Birth Defect Center. Okay. Yeah, here in Mass. So. And, um, what was it that actually triggered your curiosity to what's going on with my son? Well, when he was born, his head was pretty big. And in my family, my nieces always had big heads. So, you know, I wasn't that worried about it. But Heidi being a mother, she pursued it. And we ended up going to Boston and seeing a neurosurgeon who measured his head for ages three to six months after six months of going down there and you know worrying she came back and said oh everything's fine just bring him home you know his head's back in line with his body he'll he'll be fine she kept saying something isn't right you could hear his breathing throughout the house that was the big thing to me was the breathing and the constant runny nose yeah. number of ear infections but the breathing you could hear him breathing from three rooms away and i just i was thinking cystic fibrosis and um, or something. I just wanted to get on it. If it was something bad, I wanted to get on it as soon as possible, just in case it was anything we could do. And thank God that we did. So he had, um, back then, upper respiratory problems? Yeah, he had ear infections, upper respiratory, runny nose. His tongue would stick out more than, you know, the normal kid. But, of course, you know, we didn't know anything about Perla syndrome or MPS, so. He also didn't look like any of us, which was kind of, he, I mean, he was adorable, you know, and, um, and funny story, when we went to see Dr. Feingold, who I adore. Um, we still see him. Yeah. When we first met him, he took one look at Sam and he said, hmm, he's got those gruff facial features, he's got thick eyebrows, I'll be Close right back. Yeah. He left the room and I looked at Keith and I said, I don't like this guy. What's he talking about? He's cute as a button. And I've told that story in front of some of his colleagues. And, at first, and, I, and then I add, and thank God that he noticed those gruff features because that's what saved his life. So he kind of says, oh, okay, she's going to say something. Whoops. When was Taylor diagnosed? He was officially diagnosed. Actually, he was right at 12 months. Mm -hmm. We'd taken him in for his year checkup with the pediatrician, and well, he'd had the kyphosis since he, we noticed that. Why? Kyphosis of the in back, his back. That curvature. Okay. And that was kind of the signal that, what's you know, what's the deal? And the doctor's like, oh, it's no big <clears> deal. But if it's still kind of like that, we'll we'll X-ray when he's a year old. And so that's X-ray because his birthday's in December, and the doctor didn't want to tell us before Christmas, but I kind of pushed her, and she did. Um, and then we went and saw, uh, we didn't see a geneticist until January. It was in January. She was actually out of New, New Mexico, Mexico, but <clears throat> would come here to Scottsdale, so we met with her here in Scottsdale. So Taylor was just over a year old when, when he was fishing. diagnosed. And, and then it took a while to find out, because then they tested and they found out he had MPS. Do you want any ice cream now? I want get I want. We just had a we just had a chocolate milk, monkey. No, I want. We just had a chocolate milk. I want you to get ice cream now, please. Where am I gonna get ice cream? Um, First off, I can't leave. Why? Because I can't leave you here by yourself. Oh. You're gonna get in so much trouble if you're in here by yourself. 
I'm not. Oh yeah, you'll you'll go and you'll order some beers and you'll go and you'll hit on the nurses and stuff like that. You'll just get into trouble. Trouble, mister. No. Yeah? I want beer, Dad. No? Where beer? Well, you probably have a cooler in beside your bed. What? Of beer. Oh, the table, Dad. Oh, you just leave the beer on the table? What? Hey, what's your name? What's your name, buddy? Trey. What's your name? Trey. What's your last name? Purcell. Very good. How old are you? Seven. Say hello. Hello. Now say goodbye. Goodbye. Uh -huh. Do you remember when you guys started to realize that there might have been something a little off? We never knew anything was the diagnosis, like we got a diagnosis and that was the, like, we didn't know anything was wrong until the diagnosis. There were little things that, um, that came up, but they were explained away as <clears throat> typical and normal and, yeah. yeah. Like little issues, but it wasn't anything, you know. Like, a, like colds, his colds hung on and. You know, Ryan had a history of asthma, so it was, well, maybe it's probably asthma, and kids get sick a lot, and don't worry about it, and ear infections, kids get ear infections all the time, so don't worry about it, and a hernia, well, the biggest surgical procedure in kids is hernia surgery, so don't one. worry about it, and, and so we didn't, I mean, we went back to the doctor for repeated things, but they were all typical, common childhood issues that nobody gave us any reason to think that anything else was going on. And what led you guys to keep pushing forward and finding out what the definite problem was? Um, I, because we'd been to doctors numerous times, or we had a pediatrician and we, I'd been back repeatedly, as I mentioned, for common childhood issues. Um, we got to know our pediatricians and I didn't like the first two. So I was looking for a new pediatrician and, um, my mom introduced us to. Yeah, his mom gave us the name of a good, of a good, uh, quite a respected and and very good pediatrician who'd been around for quite a while. Yeah. And when we went and saw him, uh, kind of took one look at Trey and knew he had some type of a storage disease. He didn't know, of course, which one, but I he think knew. he knew it was MPS. Yeah, I think he didn't know it was MPS. He just I, didn't say anything to us at the time. Uh, and how old was he when this happened? 23 months. Okay, so just shy of two years. He probably had an enlarged liver. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's probably what signaled and also his he, face. Yeah, facial features and enlarged liver and hernia and big head. <laughs> yes. And, you know, all of the... All the signs the, now, we know MPS too. We, we, if we saw Trey on the street at 23 months, we would probably say, hey, that kid looks like he has MPS too. But... We didn't know. He just looked like our cute little kid. We didn't know. Yeah. Knowing that you were a carrier, or even knowing that you didn't know you were a carrier, was there, I guess, you decided to have children? Yeah. Was there any talk about it, or... Oh yeah, we had talked a lot about it before. Yeah, extensively about it. Yeah. We had trouble, we had a lot of trouble getting pregnant. And with our daughter, we had to go on fertility medicines and finally got pregnant with her. And we were really relieved when we found out we were having a girl. We found out she was a girl right before Jeff went to Korea. And then along came <laughs> Jaren. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Jaren was, Jaren was a huge surprise yeah, he was he was one of those bob ross happy accident type thing <laughs> and i i was scared to death from the moment i got pregnant you know from the moment i found out you know because not only you know we had the fears because melissa herself she was born with a bilateral cleft lip and cleft palate and that was just a huge thing and then it was like, okay, gosh, you know, we got really lucky with her, you know, and what now? And, yeah. you know, we wouldn't have changed anything for the world. I didn't want to do the prenatal testing 
because I was concerned about the risks to the baby and we went as far as to make sure that we knew what we were having so that we could have everything set up mm -hmm. to know to be able to do testing and um, the plan had been to um, do the testing right away you know after birth that next day but um, he ended up he was in respiratory distress and had to be life lighted and so he was about I want to say 12 days old when they did his testing because they wanted to make sure that you know they got the best samples possible that there wasn't any medications in it that could cause any issues and then the day he was the exact day that he was one month old it was the day before it was the day before Melissa's fourth birthday we went in for the genetics appointment we were staying in guest housing at Fort Riley we were all alone didn't know a soul we drove the two hours to Kansas City and they sat us down and told us that he had it. Okay. I'm sure that was devastating. It was. <laughs> it was. Did, did you know about El Prefet? No, we didn't. Okay. We didn't. I wasn't aware. I had, I had refused during the pregnancy to do any research <laughs> okay. about hunters and... Um, anything like that. I had actually found the MPS forum while I was pregnant with him, but I was afraid to go on there. I was kind of afraid to jinx myself. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but, you know, the things you the things you do for the people you love and... It seems like with us, if it wasn't for bad luck, we would have no luck at all. So, we kind of wash ourselves during her pregnancy and made sure we try to do everything to try to have the best outcome. And when we got the news, it was hard. But we come to the reality that we could only take it day by day. And do everything we could to um, give Jaron. We had to do our best to do to, what was right for Jaron. To give him the best quality of life we could because at that time with the diagnosis and everything like that with the doctor um, I believe she said that uh, oh, how she said how she said as far as Jared she told us that he was severe parents that the material they give you is horrible it's pretty scary yes um, uh, the first thing that the doctor told me when um, Roger was diagnosed is uh, if you're pregnant you need to abort and if you're not you need to make sure you don't have any other children and um, that was pretty scary uh, but um, and and you know then you know she will not live to be past her mid teens um, and uh, that was, uh, I probably had a, <laughs> a nervous breakdown that I couldn't really have. I mean, I, I, um, I had lost a child in an automobile accident, and so this was really, for me, um, a real, um, it was a just news that I didn't want to hear. And um, I had no idea at the time anything except she's not going to live. I mean, that, I guess, was what I heard. And from the material, there was really, there was nothing that really, you know, it certainly was, was 
you know, there was nothing good in the material, but it just, I guess it didn't sink in because I knew nobody with MDS. And, you know, it was, uh, um, so I, I guess the MPS part wasn't as scary as the, you know, as the longevity of life was not an option. And uh, so it, it's been kind of a uh, learn as you go process for me. And uh, Rachel was one of the older children with MPS, one. And so, uh, uh, it was, uh, well, how old is she now? She's 24. So, obviously, they were wrong. Yeah. Um, they also, um, we met years ago, I don't remember. We <laughs> met when I first started the Ella Praise trial. Right. And Rachel was actually part of the... It was really the phase two. Okay. Trial for for aldurazone, which is the enzyme replacement. For the right, it's the enzyme replacement. But the first trial was almost not a trial because it was really only six people. Th that was ours. I was one of twelve. Right. They only do it for safety. Right. And right. It, it's not really. It was, it's not really a trial. It's no, it's just to make sure you don't die. And well, and the scary thing about this one, however, was how many of two them? of those people died. You know. Well, they probably would have passed away. But and you, you're probably right. And when you're in a position where there is nothing else that you have. This is it. This is, you know, the future. If you want a future, this is your only chance. You just don't think twice about it. It doesn't matter how hard it is or what, or how much of a long shot it is. Now, talking to the parents and people with MPS disorders, um, you can't help but look forward into the child's future. And unfortunately, the fact is that most of these parents will outlive their children. Now, originally, I was only going to go to the homes of children that were still alive. And one family did actually slip through. It was a mistake. And I am very glad that it did slip through. This family was so inspirational, and I learned so much just by being around them, that I had to share them with people. Had to show them how the love of this child that passed away several years ago was still around. Richard recently, or at least within the last year, two years, has passed away. That's right, 15 months ago. And how old was he when he passed away? 25. What kind of signs did you see that led you to believe there was something not correct with him? We didn't see any definite signs. I He was a twin, so... And we, with the three other kids, we had a good idea that he was on target with all his milestones. But it was unusual he had to have his adenoids out at 14 months. He had had some bronchial problems. Um, so we just noticed that was a little different. He had had an umbilical hernia. Nothing unusual. What was unusual was that one child had all of these same things. At his routine two-year-old physical, um, our pediatrician, who had been discounting that it was kind of unusual for one child, um, I could tell, I still remember it, sitting in the chair, his brother had already been examined for the checkup, and I could just see the doctor was spending a little bit more time examining his abdomen, and uh, I remember asking him, saying, what's up? He says, oh, nothing, and I had commented that his fontanelle had it closed and uh, he had detected a very slight enlarged liver and that was the start of the process there. At that time was probably, I didn't even go into the, the meeting, the examination with any concern. Okay, and um, roughly how long after that did it take them to 
diagnosed San Filippo A. Two, Two and, and a half it. months. Um, after that, you guys were told, maybe you want to explain, what were you told by the doctor about the outcome and what you could do? Well, we had gone to a Children's Hospital in Boston, Dr. Alan Crocker, and he explained that uh, a little what he knew about uh, MPS and San Filippo. And uh, it wasn't a good prognosis, it was all negative. And um, we would be looking forward to difficult times in a degenerative uh, existence for Richard, both mentally and physically. <laughs> he came down by himself. I mean, how bad is this? <laughs> I'm sorry, but don't. <laughs> Richard, how bad is this? You know you have to come home. <laughs> don't let him have any more. That's terrible. <laughs> Richard, <laughs> it's time. No more beer. No more beer. Do you understand? I think that one of the hardest parts about having a child with a severe disability is knowing that one day they will pass on. Now, these two families I'm about to show you, they both had recently lost a child, and they still have one more with the same disability which means that all they can do is just wait for that child to pass on. And I think that's probably one of the hardest things to do. And your children are? Stephanie Barnett and Stephen Barnett. And ages? Stephanie died at age 15 on February 26, 2011, and Stephen is 14. Yeah, when we first were diagnosed, um, it's like being punched in the stomach. It just hurts so bad, and, and you just, it's hard to really see past the end of it. And imagine what your life's going to be like. You just can't, because it's you know everything that you read and everything you know is going to happen. It's just grim. It's just horrible. And uh, so I guess the beginning days of the diagnosis are just so bleak, and you feel so hopeless. But know that life does get better. You learn to treasure your kids and to really just take each day, day by day, not trying to think about tomorrow or five years from now or what life's going to be like and just really treasure your kids. Yeah, live in the moment. And, uh, and love them and you find a new, a new value to life that, you know. Now, was there anything in particular that helped you guys deal with it? Or? I did, I read a lot of books really just searched out a lot of information and anything I can find to help me to cope and help me to, to really deal with the stress. Um, I think dealing with stress is going to be key to getting through the days because there's going to be a lot of stressful days ahead. Okay, and uh, do you want to show me that picture? Oh sure. This is a picture of Stephanie. Uh, this was taken on her 15th birthday and this is actually the uh, pamphlet that was given out at her funeral service. And on the back of this flyer we wrote, pain and acceptance can coexist in the heart to create peace. And that's one thing we learned is that, you know, there's a place in your heart to allow that grief and to allow that pain and that hurt and not allow it to take over your life and ruin your life, but to allow it to exist and you can deal with it and manage it and, uh, and accept it so that you can have a peaceful life and, and still treasure what life is given. One thing that you're going to find out is as you're diagnosed and you get more involved with MPS, you're going to find that your family's going to grow. Um, there's many, many, many wonderful people out there uh, through the MPS family that you're going to meet and you're going to learn to cherish these people and to love them very much. Um, they're really the only people that's going to understand uh, what you're going through. So it, my advice is to embrace these people. Get to know them um, 
and because you're gonna you're gonna find a lot of strength and, and a lot of knowledge um, through these other individuals who's walking the same path as you. Chip and David. Dave have Hunter syndrome. And Chip recently passed away. Yes, yes he did. Okay. Last March. Um, that's a pretty recent. Recent. Okay. Um. At what age were they diagnosed? David was four, Chip was two, and Chip was diagnosed first. Was there something lead you guys to believe that there is something wrong? Um, I had my degree in early childhood education. Um, at one year, I felt there was something wrong with Dave. So there was just a lot of delays there, and Chip even had more than what David did. Okay. Now, um, this isn't a surprise to you guys, because, I mean, it's a surprise that it happened, but it's not a surprise since it runs in your family. Right. We had no idea that I was a carrier because of what was told to my aunt that was only passed to the first female in each family. Um, so we knew that my aunt had kids, but honestly, I never knew what they had. It was kind of hidden in the closet at that point in time. I did not know that my my um, grandma had two boys, so I actually had two uncles with it, and that she had a brother with it until after our boys were diagnosed. So that's when everything kind of came out to us. So it, it's there, but we didn't know. We and, never suspected. Yeah. Okay, so it was a big shock. It was a shock to us, yeah. But then when you finally told your family, they were like, oh, yeah, we had that. Yeah. But they thought it was her letters, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's what was told to my aunt back in the 60s is that her boys had curlers. You looked at pictures of them, correct? Yes. And they have hunters? They have hunters. Although it's very similar, but... Right, yeah. And even my um, uncles, you could tell if they had hunter syndrome. Do you remember how old he was when he was diagnosed? Um, we started the testing about one, and it was about one and a half by the time we got everything. Okay. Um, now, was there anything that triggered an alarm? Why we went for the yeah. testing? Yeah, we noticed the, the bump in his spine. So it just started there. We started actually kind of like at a back doctor first, okay. and then to a specialist, which ended up in genetics. Okay, now it actually runs in your family, correct? Right, I had a half brother who had it, who was born in 1961 and passed away at the age of 12. Okay, so it wasn't a complete and total shock? Well, it was because that's kind of a different story because I didn't know of my brother's diagnosis. I knew of my brother well, I was a couple of years younger and when he turned five, he went to live in a state hospital. That's what a lot of them did back then, apparently. Yeah. So by the time I started having children 30 years later, I, I don't know if it was just put in the back of my mother's head, just forgot about it. I had so many sisters that had children that um, it was just never mentioned. So none of us knew of his diagnosis. Okay, so? So there was no, I didn't have any idea I should be doing any kind of genetic testing. Okay. And you said you do have a lot of other siblings? Yeah. And how many? Well, I have, there's eight of us in okay. my family, but I have three older sisters who have had children before me, long before me. And, um, most of them were girls, a couple boys, so, but everybody was fine. Um, has anyone in the family ever been tested since? Um, I've had one niece tested, and I think that's about it right now. And your other sisters are aware of right Now they're aware. Yeah. Their daughters are aware, yeah. Okay. So they, they know that they have the, you know, ability to get tested. Can you please tell me your names? I'm Brian Mado. I'm Marcy Humphrey. And Brian, you have? MPS2 uh, Hunter Syndrome. 
Um, how old are you approximately? 39, but I feel like I'm 90 something in MPS years. Okay. Um, do you remember when you were diagnosed? I was diagnosed at age five from Dr. Kopitz and Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Now, um, you have a brother, right? Yeah, I have an older brother. He's three or four years older than me. He also has MPS? Yep. So, were the diagnosis because of him, because of you, or both of you? Um, I guess my mother had it in her family, so she kind of suspected. And she just realized that, you know, we weren't growing properly. So, they, our primary care doctor recommended Dr. Kopitz in Baltimore, Maryland. Okay, now you say it ran in your family. Um, what other relatives do you have? Uh, I have a distant cousin in Ohio. I think he's about 26 right now. Uh, I've only met him a couple times. And I just recently found out maybe seven years ago that I had a great, great uncle who died when he was 44 years old. And that was in, you said, early 1900s? 1915 around there. Okay. What age did you guys start to realize that there was something going wrong? When he was like a five, when he went to school for the first time, that and he couldn't learn. Couldn't learn. The professor, the teacher, uh, told us that something was wrong, and it took about it took about one year to discover the illness because of the, it is so weird that the doctors didn't know. Okay, so at about six mm -hmm. you started to investigate? No, like around five, and he was diagnosed when he was six. Oh, so they actually figured, what it, figured out what it was? Yes. That's pretty good. I've heard of a lot of, like, San Filippos, mm -hmm. yeah. um, them not getting diagnosed at all. like. They get, they get diagnosed as autistic. Mm -hmm. and then, That's why they told us at the beginning that he was autistic. But then uh, we went to yeah. the genetics uh, department at Miami Children's Hospital. and One of the themes that quickly emerged as I went on my trip was the family's belief in a higher being or a higher power. So whether they believed in God, Jesus, Allah, or anyone else. There were two stories that I'm going to show you that if you do believe in the higher power this will reinforce your belief even more. But if you don't believe in one you probably will after this. And which one of your children is affected with an MPS disorder? Ian Moses Bailey. He's, he goes by his middle name Moses, and he has MPS type 3C. 3C. And MPS doesn't run at all in your family, and also Moses is... He's adopted. Okay. Um, it's an interesting story about how he was adopted. I've heard it from you. Maybe you want to tell me from your perspective? Um, my wife and I were working on a short-term assignment in a missionary school in Pakistan between 96 and 98 and uh, it was in the spring of 1998 um, there had been a, a very heavy blizzard in that part of the country and um, just after that blizzard when school opened there still lots of snow on the ground um, on the same day that Becky started teaching in class, I was going through the woods near the school to uh, go from one section of the campus to the other, and I found um, our son Moses. Uh, somebody had deposited him in the snow in a plastic trash bag along a small trail that went through the middle of the woods there that went down to a main road that I was heading towards. So uh, I picked him up and uh, raced him back to uh, the school to the dispensary and got him warmed up and then we began a rather lengthy process of um, you know getting the legal permissions and the documents that were necessary to um, adopt him 
both there and then to bring him back to the States and adopt him here. I think having a third child has actually helped a little bit with that. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been really good. I, you know, I definitely think, um, you know, it, that was definitely God. So, we actually, um, I was actually heading to the doctor um, to get a vasectomy and totaled my car. And then never rescheduled the appointment, and we had Amy. Two months later. Wow. Yeah. When did you guys start to realize that there was something going on? He he had a murky medical start. He was intubated um, at birth. Um, in and out of the hospital for various unknown reasons. He had an infection. Um, and then developmentally, he was delayed in all aspects, physically mostly. Didn't ever roll over, crawl. Um, and really what led us to his diagnosis was around 14 months he lost his language. He had about six or seven words and then they were unintelligible, we couldn't understand, and then they were gone. And then his sleeping patterns started to really present. And so we went to an ENT physician that was recommended through our pedi pediatrician. And we were just really fortunate. Our ENT doctor um, had worked with a kiddo with Hurler syndrome out in California doing his residency. And he just kind of took note of Jack's facial features and asked if he could take a picture of Jack and send it to. A geneticist and, and from there on they tested him for hurlers it was negative positive for hunter syndrome now, now you say facial months. features do you mean like me which means he's dead sexy <laughs> he is dead sexy hot he is a handsome handsome he boy is. you guys still had your left son correct mm -hmm. yes yes we had levi <laughs> Now, was that planned or was just... <laughs> Definitely not planned. No, okay. planned. We, we found out about our little buddy there um, about 12 hours before we Jeff deployed, deployed the last time. So oh, wow. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I was really sick and I told him, I said, you need to go buy a test for me in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I am so sick. <coughs> and, you know, we couldn't even enjoy those you know, that last day together, I was so sick. And I told him, I said, I don't think it's possible, but you need to go buy me a test in the morning. <laughs> because I don't want to be that wife that finds out after you have deployed that we're pregnant. <laughs> and so he got me the test, and oh, Lord. <laughs> we both about fell over, and we... Well, we are, we've been through this once. We can do it again if if Levi has hunters. We can we know the avenues of approach to take. We know what to do. We're pros. And and we'll just have to take it day by day with him too. And I chose to drive almost two hours to the doctors to have the best neonatologists and everyone and um, they kept good track of him on ultrasound we found out for sure that it was a boy okay. and they pushed and pushed wanting me to have the amnio and I just told them if no there's nothing's gonna it won't change anything he's he's already there he's already growing he's already our son and so we waited and we had the plan because we were two hours away from the hospital that I had a whole big envelope with test tubes and very specific instructions on if I were to go into labor they were to do very specific things to test for the hunters and um, luckily Levi waited <laughs> until daddy came home for R&R &R okay. and we drove out to the hospital and ended up, we had a little bit of a rough time 
having him. Had to have an emergency C-section, but everything turned out well in the end. And he tried to come out waving at the <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so they they did the testing with yeah. his cord blood and. Wanted kids. Yeah. Doesn't matter. You weren't sure how. We were, we were looking at possible uh, uh, other options. Okay. Um, well, but first, I mean, I don't think I was ready for another child considering our dual that, diagnosis, yeah, our double diagnosis. But um, I think he was more ready. Um, so, yeah, it took, I think it took me about a year to even consider what it would look like to add to our family. And then once I was on board with that, um, we started looking at different options. Sperm donation was one of them, um, adoption. Uh, we looked at even in vitro, you know, they've mentioned before that they can take <coughs> eggs and sperm and put them together and test them for San Filippo and then implant ones that don't have San Filippo. And, um, you know, we, we just have a strong faith in God and we felt like we, we kind of got to a point where we were open to adopting for special needs. And so we thought, well, if we're feeling like we should adopt a child with special needs, maybe we should just go ahead and, and trust God because we're not in control anyway and try for one ourselves because there's only a 25% chance. We know San Filippo. We love our kids regardless. Um, and we think that they're not they're not broken they're just different and that they have a lot to offer and they're they've been a huge blessing to us so we would love another child with Sam Flute, but we don't look at it as a disability for for our family we look at it as just that's the way God made them and and we're gonna love them regardless so yeah it was a big leap of faith and um, to be to be detailed we tried once so we got pregnant and Ten months later, she's here. So we just took that as a sign that whatever God wanted, He would make happen. And so, yeah, we still don't know. And we look at her and we try to figure it out. And you know, there are moments where we think she definitely has San Filippo because she looks like her brother and sister. And then there are other moments we look at her and we're like, maybe she doesn't. So we don't know. But ultimately, we're good with whatever. I mean, we surely don't like the outcome of what happens. But so they, take, they took blood or anything? They did take blood. It's at the lab. We're just waiting for a phone call. But if she's a carrier, she'll be like us. So as long as she doesn't marry someone that's also a carrier, she should be fine. So no marrying within the family. <laughs> yes. <Wait a> <laughs> Don't yeah. marry your uncle, and no. the man will need a blood test before I say it's okay. <laughs> you can't have your sister and a, yeah. We're, yeah, for dating, we're going to just t collect blood, like when they come to pick her up for prom. We're going to need a blood sample. Now, the next group of people I'm going to interview are the siblings of the people affected. Now, the siblings on a whole were very nice. Some of the stories they told me were positive, while some were negative. So, here you go. Do you feel you had a little resentment? Definitely, yeah. There's, you know, I've definitely seen that. Um, a lot of it is, I never treated him any different to me. It was just my little brother and I just treated him like any older sister would, you know. Yeah. And it, what, probably affect me negatively, negatively is seeing other people treat him very differently and special treatment and you know and some things are limitations but some things I'd see um, people treat him and still treat him differently with things that have nothing to do with his limitations or his disease or anything like that so that's probably the the biggest thing. Now um, we spoke about the attention from the parents um, were you ever neglected or not neglected, but did you ever feel like he got more attention because he needed it? Yeah, I mean, at times. I mean, he was always going to doctor's appointments and going out of state and, you know, whatnot and 
had different things that their attention was directed towards and so yeah I definitely felt that but also you know and they like I mentioned before treated them different still sometimes treat them differently too than than I would I don't know the word I'm trying to say um than I would <laughs> I guess if I was I mean I'm not a parent but for my eyes. You are now. Well, I am a parent. I am a parent. That's right. That's true. Okay, so you think that maybe there were some differences on how to treat him? Like, they treated him different and you didn't? Yeah, I think what she kind of refers to when she says special treatment, um, to her it's negative. It's got a negative connotation that... Um, of course, there's special treatment that's needed due to, you know, disability, special needs, anything like that. But when she says it, it's referring to um, special treatment that's given to him because he um, has MPS. But it's treatment that's given to him that has is not related to the disease. Um, and so it's, you know, more like, oh, he's getting special treatment. Um, and that's what kind of what she would do differently. It's like, why is he being, you know, why is he not being punished for this where I would? Um, is it just because he's got MPS when that MPS has nothing to do with this situation Never at situation. hand? Yeah. For example. I don't usually do this, but I'm going to respond to you guys for that. Um, I've noticed a lot of parents feel they're responsible. So they feel bad because they gave the child that disorder which is why they give them leeway unfortunately it doesn't really it doesn't look well to the other siblings so like I could probably get away with way more than anyone else in my family but luckily I was a perfect child so <laughs> so I also, I want you to know a lot of other siblings do say this in videos, so you're not alone. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, what he just said. Never thought of it that way. Yeah. You gotta look at things from a different point of view. MPS hasn't really stopped you from doing what you love, has it? No. I find ways around find ways around it to get the things done and want to get done and push forward. Uh, there's always a hurdle in front of me, but supporting my family and good friends, close friends, I'm able to get around it. Okay, so um, is there any real lessons that you think having an FPS disorder or any other disorder has taught you? I think patience and understanding is a big one that I've really learned. If you were to talk to someone or a group of people who were just diagnosed, what would you say to them as words of encouragement? Someone who was just diagnosed? Yeah. Um, you know, just do what you love. Be who you are. It's just because you have this condition doesn't set you back. There's ways around difficulties. It's a real place in front of you, just jump over it, get around it. Okay. Now, would you say anything to the parents of children who were just diagnosed? To the parents? You know, it is a life changing experience, but it doesn't mean you can't live a normal or so-called normal life. It doesn't mean that your child's going to be the outcast of a group. So just be supportive and really um, help them get what to what they want to do. Like my parents have been really, really supportive and in high school they supported me in doing what I loved, which was being the manager for the sports teams. I am Sam Caswell. I have type 1 um, MPS.
Crowley syndrome. And how old are you? I am 16 years old. And um, who are your parents? My parents are Keith Caswell and Heidi Caswell. And you also have a sister? Yep. Her name's Jenna, and she's 21, and she gave me bone marrow 15 years ago. I don't know. I feel like as an, as an older sibling, you generally don't kind of... I don't know, look up to your younger sibling as much as I think that I do, just because, I mean, I go to the doctor and get a flu shot and I feel like I'm going to pass out. <laughs> and then I see all the things that he does and I just feel ridiculous because it's amazing to me how many things that he's gone through and how positive he's managed to, to stay for the most part. As he's getting older and he's noticing more things that are different than him and people are getting their licenses and... Um, with his eyes, he hasn't been able to, and getting girlfriends, and just keeping friendships has always been kind of hard for him, because when everybody wants to go ride bikes or go do different things that he can't do, it's hard. And um, I just think that he's dealt with it all so great. <laughs> so I really think that I look up to him more than most older siblings would. I think, you know... You know, Richard, too, he, he motivated you to push yourself to be as good as you can be. <clears throat> you know, when, like, you have all these gifts, you can move, you know, when you can move and you're, you know, I was pretty athletic. Like, you know, I feel like I was motivated even more because he couldn't do it. You know, I was going to go out there and do the best I could with, uh, with the things that I had. And so I think, you know, there is a motivation there to um, make him proud, to do the best he can. Did you ever feel guilty about being fine? Um, yeah, I think sometimes I think about it. I'm not sure if guilty would be the word I'd, I'd use, but sometimes, I, you know, I think about how fortunate... Um, I am to have a brother like Richard, but also, you know, what what I should be doing to better myself all the time because I'm so fortunate not to have a de disease like MPS, you know, specifically San Filippo 3A. Um, you know, I think it, it has a big impact to motivate you to try and do things with your life and, and get out there and just try and help people because when you have a twin brother diagnosed with a disease like that, it's it's um, it almost makes you want to get up and go and, and make a serious impact anywhere in the world, just anywhere. I, I call it, I relate it a lot to uh, survivor's guilt. Yeah, yeah. It's a good term for it. Yeah. It's a good term for it. Um, do you feel that maybe having your brother with MPS has helped in any way? It's driven me to be... I always try to do the best that I can in anything I do, in school, in any, any extracurricular activity, I do anything at all. I, he's always in the back of my head, and I realize that I'm very lucky, so I always just strive to be the best that I can. That's one of the main things that he's given me. I understand you're going to college to yes. be a... Oh, I'm studying to be a doctor. Oh, doctor. Uh, do you feel that this having your brother with MPS has had a? Sorry. What's going on, man? <laughs> Come on, we're we'll, we'll doing an interview. Sorry, she was bothered. It's okay. Um, do you think that your brother being the way he is has affected what you want to do? Yeah, absolutely. He's the reason why I want to help people for the rest of my life. Well, it hurts me to see him. Actually, I feel guilty sometimes that I was the one that got to live a normal life. A lot of times, actually. Every time I'm going to school or I'm going to work and I go to say bye to him, it's, I, I get like a feeling of guilt. And I've even told my friends sometimes that, uh, you know, I will chill with me sometimes. Because he was just such a great guy when he was little. Yeah, that's, that's kind of like... Um... Survivor's guilt. Yeah, pretty much. That's exactly it. Yeah. If you were asked to talk to a person who just found out 
that their sibling had an MPS disorder, and say that person's about your age, maybe younger, what would what advice would you give them? I'd explain how he, he'd go through different stages of it. Oh, like first, he or she, like first he'd go through a really violent and crazy stage. Are you you're like, talking about the effect affecting yeah, them? Okay. Effect affecting them at the first stage and then I talk about how he'd start losing all his skills and how he'd be gaining a lot less I realized over the time he lost a lot of weight too like it was really weird and um, he used he stopped um, his joints just stopped working in his mind and I'd explain how that happens, and I'd explain how they get to this stage where they couldn't do anything or like say anything, but they'd still be able to under see, know who you are and notice you. They'd be able to understand your voice, and sometimes they lose their hearing or their eyesight, and because my brother has hearing aids now, um, we can't we don't really know if he's blind or not because we really can't tell with him, and so. Uh, I'd explain how that could happen. I explain how someday he might pass away, but you'd get you'll get over it because, like, you'd have to expect that with this disease. Like I have to. Okay, and now, um, yeah. I would probably say how they'll be normal until they start getting around where they can walk and stuff, and then they'll start being they'll start stop slowly losing things that most people can do. Like their knowledge? Like, yeah. Yeah. And, um, I'll say, um, like, it will be okay, and, because I've went through it, and I'll tell them how I've dealt with it, and if, like, you need someone to talk with, to, or someone either talk to your parents or someone one of your friends or your teacher or something. Or you could just talk to us since yeah. we've been through it and we understand. Shallower without John. Like if he if he had never been in our lives, I think I would have taken a lot of things for granted. Like just the fact that I can think and that I can I have an opinion and I can voice those opinions and I think I'd take that for granted if I didn't have John. I think I'd be a lot shallower. I think I'd be a lot, I don't know, less likely to, okay, cat? But I think I'd be a lot, I don't know, I don't think I'd appreciate things the way I do now. Okay, so you feel that having John in your life has allowed you to appreciate the little things? Yeah, it's made me, it's made me a better person. Now, have you connected to other, any other MPS families or siblings? Or? My mom has. I have not so much because I don't want... I almost don't want to hear about all the symptoms of this disease, especially San Filippo Syndrome, because I don't want to start looking for them. I don't want to start watching him to see the day that he's going to do this or that he's going to do that or something. I don't want, I don't want to do that. I want to just enjoy him while we have him and not look forward to, you know, the horrible yeah. parts. I don't want that. It's understandable. So I really haven't connected to any other families much. So. Okay. Well, um, I understand you're going to college. Uh, well, yeah. Well, you're going into your senior year. I'm going to my senior year of high school, so I'm applying for college soon. And you're extremely intelligent, from what I gather. <laughs> I'm in honors classes, and so and I do fairly well on them. Okay. Well, you know what? Um, I guess that's good. Yeah. Um, would you want to say anything to any other siblings so people just found out? Who just found out? Yeah. Like if someone would have said to you something. I would say just, just hang in there and just enjoy every, enjoy them for who they are. Don't try to think about who they were at two or three years old or what they were. Think, enjoy who they are now and just, just enjoy them as they are. Um, do you ever have any problems with him, playing with him? Well, yeah, yeah, I do, because usually he really likes to, you know, hit and 
bite and throw things. So, I'm a sister, so I usually get them thrown at me. So, yeah. And how does that make you feel? Upset. Because it hurts, and then it's like he's my brother, and you think he wouldn't do that, but you have to just, you know, understand that you can't help it. Okay. Um, do you think that you'd learn anything from Quinn, having him in your life? Yeah, um, like, a lot of things that, like, um, to have, you know, just make him feel good, and, you know, just to be yourself, and to be, you know, kind and loving, because even though he hits, he still loves me. Okay. I met your neighbor yesterday and he commented on how great of a kid you are. Mm -hmm. Do you think you're a great kid? Yeah. Okay. Not trying to be conceited though. No, you're not at all. She's, mm -hmm. she's not really people. She's not conceited. She's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, if you had to give a comment or suggestion to, um, other siblings that are just finding out that their sibling has an MPS disorder, maybe not hunters, um, would you, what would be your suggestion? Um, to, to be kind to them and not get mad at them easily, because they will get really mad easily back, and to just have fun with them. What's it like having Trey as a brother? Pretty fun? Sometimes it can be fun, sometimes it's not. Yeah, like okay. today when he was playing, he wasn't scoring on you? you were... No, it was he wasn't even shooting. He, 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 sometimes he's like, sometimes he's mad at me and sometimes he's nice. Do you know that most brothers are like that? Yeah. You should have seen Uncle Cleet and I. Woo! Oh, cha joy. Okay, well you guys want to say goodbye? Goodbye. Goodbye. I hope you enjoyed watching my journey as much as I enjoyed going on it. And I hope you guys took something away from it. I can tell you that the one thing I took away from it was no matter who you are or where you come from, life will give you a challenge. Now it's your job to decide how you're going to deal with that challenge. You can either overcome it or back down. Now most of the people in this video, I personally believe did rise to the occasion. So, until next time, have a lovely day. These words that I proclaim, they might sound cliche, but you gotta do what you gotta do to keep from going insane. It's not about losing the weight. It's not about making the grade. It's about creating your own fate. Through the love you cultivate It's not about trying to be perfect It's not just scratching the surface You have a beauty So much more than just skin deep Don't care what people say Just follow your own way It's not about waiting for the storm to pass It's about dancing in the rain It's about following your bliss It's about, about being brave Your own life you gotta save From drowning in the sea Of mediocrity Don't let them tell you who to be Only you can set you free It's about planting the seed It's about being who you need Instead of throwing away the key Being open to see no matter what your age If you're black, white, straight or gay There's no more, no more time for shame Cause you're dancing in the rain Dancing in the rain We're dancing in the rain Dancing in the rain
from a burning flame With every dream there comes a haze Gotta have some faith when you're dancing in the rain mm -hmm. These words that I proclaim they might sound cliche, but you gotta do what you gotta do Cause you're dancing in the rain If at first you don't receive it Pick yourself up, don't stop believing When you're scared and feeling cheated Just remember you are needed How can they say we've been defeated? We're here together, dancing in Dancing in the rain Dancing in the rain